Zoom thing and it's a little bit tricky. I'm Katie Picaric. I'm an extension educator in the school here. I work with water quality. Today, your speaker, you get a, a treat. He's actually one of our faculty members here, but he holds about 10 different titles. Uh, this is Jesse Bell with the, the Water Climate and Health Program out of UNMC. Uh, he's also faculty within the department. And then you can see his long list of titles up there. So with that, uh, he's got a very uh, broad, broad view of what you guys do over in water climate health. So I'll let you take it over. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Really appreciate it. Appreciate being here today. Sorry for the delay. Um, put this up here. And so I'll give you a little bit of background on me. Uh, then I'll jump into talking a little bit about some of the work that we're doing. Um, so I'm originally from Nebraska. I'm from Northeast Nebraska. I, I've been out of the, I was out of the state for about 20 years before I came back from my current position. Um, and I started that about five years ago, a little over five years ago, working uh, over at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And in 2020, my position changed and just a little bit. And so now I work between UNL and UNMC through the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute, where I'm a director there. Prior to that, um, my background is actually focused on uh, Bio, well, my PhD was focused on biogeochemistry, actually. And I was really focused on hydrology and climate change. And then uh, I started working at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I worked at what then was the National Climatic Data Center. And, um, and then uh, now is National Center for Environmental Information. And so in... While I was working at NOAA, I got an excellent opportunity to create a joint position between the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia, with NOAA. And so what I was doing there was helping bring over environmental data that we had at NOAA. NOAA is one of the main stewards of environmental data for the world, uh, so that we could integrate that into health studies. And that's really where a lot of my health work started. And so I've been doing that for quite a while now. Um, and continue that work here at the University of Nebraska. And so we had this wonderful opportunity to create the Water Climate and Health Program that started in uh, 2020, like I said, and this was in a collaboration with the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute here across the University of Nebraska system. And the whole premise behind Water Climate and Health uh, and the development of it was to try to pioneer interdisciplinary research, education, and collaborative solutions to public health challenges that we face around climate and water. And in particular, uh, just more broadly, environmental change, both here and around the world. And the whole, you know, when we founded this, it wasn't just to do research. Uh, research is obviously one of the foundations of what we do at the University of Nebraska um, because we are an academic center. And so research and education are obviously two of our main components. But we also are very interested in engagement and uh, outreach and even policy development, but in the, the broadest term of that. We wanna make sure that we're providing sound scientific information to help with policy decision-making. So the program started in 2020 and there were about three people in the program at that time. Um, we've grown, we've gotten additional funding in a variety of different platforms, and I'll talk about that in a bit. And so right now we're at, um, if you count faculty, staff, and students, we're at about 28 faculty, staff, and students that are supported through water, climate, and health in some capacity. Um, and bless you. And, uh, with some potential for continuous growth as well. And we have a broad, diverse uh, group of expertise in our group. We have everything from epidemiologists, toxicologists, biostatisticians, people that have worked more in environmental data science, um, people with more programmatic background, uh, spatial analysis, you kind of name it. Uh, we have it in the team in some capacity. 
And we also have a, a diverse group of students that are interested in a variety of different topics, both PhD students and medical students, along with MPH students. Uh, we recently started up a program, it's called an Emmet. it's an enhanced medical education track for medical students at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And so these are students that are going to be MDs, medical doctors at some point. And this is almost like a, I would say like a minor for them. And so in their first year, they apply to be a part of our program. And then over the next three to four years, um, we engage with them on doing research and education to better understand uh, issues such as climate change and how that could potentially impact human health. The whole premise is by the time that they're done, they have uh, at least some work publication in this area. They've done some research. And then on top of it, um, they're better educated, better understanding of some of these threats associated with health and our environment. And so we have a number of core areas when we're talking about research and our engagement just more broadly within water, climate, and health. We have water quality and health, and I'll talk about that. I've done some work with Katie around that. Um, climate change and health. And more specifically within climate change and health, we've done extreme heat and the impacts that it has on health, flooding, uh, drought, and extreme weather, weather and the impacts on health and then air quality and air quality issues associated with health. So to kind of kick it off, I wanna talk a little bit more broadly about some of our work around climate change and health. This figure comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Climate and Health Program. Uh, this is where I used to work in at CDC. And so the whole premise of this <clears throat> kind of sets up the stage of how climate can potentially impact human health. In that middle, that little circle that's spinning, is all the ways that our climate system is changing, whether it's more extreme weather, higher temperatures, more uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, rising sea levels, all those things that, that change in our, our climate is then impacting the environment. And through the changes in our environment, whether it be environmental degradation, more extreme heat events, uh, severe weather, changes in vector ecology, air pollution, Aero allergens, um, water quality issues, water quantity issues, and then food uh, supply issues as well. All of those things can lead to human health outcomes and a variety of different human health outcomes. I won't go through all of them. You can obviously see that there's a number of different ways that this can manifest into human health related issues. And We've understood this for a long time. If anybody's ever heard me talk about climate change and health, a lot of times what I do is I go through the story of climate change and health. And you can go all the way back to Hippocrates, who is an ancient Greek physician. And Hippocrates would talk about in his notes, you could read through them, and he talked about how changes in weather and climate patterns were potentially related to outbreaks of disease in, in ancient Greece. Well, now we move forward, we've understand this relationship much better than back then. But we also understand that this is a complex relationship as well. And so that previous circle, spinning circle figure, is illustrating all the different ways that climate can potentially impact human health. This figure I put up because it's incredibly important because we have the gray boxes on the outside. And it's the environmental institutional context and the social and behavioral context. So climate, extreme weather events, climate change, all these other things, they can impact a variety of different places. They can impact a variety of different, um, uh, and manifest in a variety of different ways. But each time they occur, you'll see different human health outcomes from a very similar event. And the reason for that is the, are those gray boxes. Social and behavioral context, that is the people that live within the community that you're in or serving or researching. And the same for the environmental institutional context. That is the physical environment that you live in. And social and behavioral context, you really have to think about it from that context of in medicine and healthcare, they call it social determinants of health. You know, what is the age of your population? What is gender uh, inequities that they face? Poverty, housing infrastructural issues, 
discrimination, access to care, pre-existing health conditions, all these things that make up the population that you live in. And then the environmental institutional context is the physical environment. So you know, is there more, what is the land use change? What is the ecosystem change, geography, agricultural use within that area? So when you see a hurricane hit one part of the country versus another part of the country, you're gonna see those differences based off of those populations and based off the physical infrastructure. And so up at the top, you have your climate drivers and you have your exposure pathways. That was like the next part of that uh, figure that I showed previously. And then lastly, those human health outcomes. Climate change and climate can impact the physical environment and can impact individuals, but they also, they impact that pathway to human health outcomes. And so I always say this, you know, whenever I've worked on, you know, I've been working on climate change for roughly 20 plus years. And while I've been working on climate change, one of the things that has come up early in my career was a lot of people were like, ah, I don't know if this is real. You know, I think maybe this is, you know, is the science really conclusive about what's happening? Well, now we've actually been able to establish a much stronger relationship and, and educate more people around that relationship between climate and, and a, a changing climate and what that means as far as how we're identifying it, all the different changes that we're seeing and how we're measuring and monitoring that. And so one of the conversations that actually comes up now a lot when I'm talking about it is, okay, it's happening, but kind of, so what? And this is the part where I really like to make this point, how we prepare and respond influences our outcomes. And so there is, you know, there's, um, you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We can do things to curb climate change in some capacity, but there's also things that we can be doing within our com communities to make sure that they're more resilient systems. So as our climate continues to change, we do not see the same health outcomes again and again. Are there ways to mitigate and reduce the potential health impacts associated with climate change? And so that's a big part of some of the work that I do is really trying to figure out how can we better prepare our public health and healthcare systems to the impacts of climate change. So there's been a number of reports that have come out uh, that says that climate and everything from you know the American or the, uh, well yeah the American Meteorological Society to the American Medical Association to the American Public Health Association have all identified climate change as a major threat. And then there's national and international reports as well. And most of these will say uh, something along the lines of climate change is a significant threat to the health of, of individuals, of people. And that all individuals are potentially vulnerable or at risk to the impacts of climate change. But one of the things that we understand, especially in public health, is certain populations are more at risk than others. And here in the United States, in particular, <clears throat> in particular um, communities of color, children, low-income communities, and older adults are more at risk than other populations. Uh, when it comes to the impacts of climate change, climate or extreme weather events, or even other potential threats that we face. And there's a variety of different reasons for that. It kind of goes back to those gray boxes that I was talking about before. Where they physically live, are they in more flood-prone areas? Um, are areas that are more likely to be hit or impacted by different events. And I'll talk about some of this in a bit. Um, do they have pre-existing health conditions? Uh, do they face discrimination, lack of access to care, different things that they face within their communities that could potentially limit their, expo or limit their impact but increase their potential exposure? And so one example is extreme heat. And we've been doing some work looking at extreme heat and the impacts of extreme heat on human health. So extreme heat likely kills more people in the United States than any other climate or weather related event. And internationally, extreme heat, we're starting to understand this better, likely kills a lot of people internationally as well. We don't do a great job of monitoring this. But just to kind of put this in, in perspective, when we look at direct health impacts associated with different climate and weather related events, extreme heat 
on average in the United States results in more fatalities than hurricanes than tornadoes than a lot of these other events that are very impactful and easy to see the, the potential outcomes. And we know that our extreme heat events are changing. We're seeing more extreme heat events over time. Um, we're seeing higher temperatures, higher humidity in certain places, and more frequent and longer heat waves. These can lead to heat stroke, dehydration, and heat related illness. At risk populations are outdoor workers, student athletes, people in cities, people without air conditioning, um, pregnant women, pregnant individuals. Uh, older adults, and then young children. And so in 2022, uh, we were a part of a NOAA project, NOAA-funded project, um, mapping urban heat island camp. Uh, it was a uh, NOAA urban heat island campaign mapping project across the country. We were one of the places uh, selected. That was Omaha, Nebraska. For anybody that's not familiar, um, with urban heat island, basically the, the whole premise is as you go into the center, into the, uh, the center of uh, metropolitan or urban areas, the temperatures are, are typically hotter. And the reason for that is you have more concrete, asphalt, things like that that uh, reflect that infrared radiation um, and or trap that infrared, ray, whatever, uh, increase that infrared ray or increase the temperatures within those locations because of higher temperatures and less green space, meaning that the temperatures are higher in those locations. And one of the things that we were interested in is what are the potential impacts in Douglas County, in Omaha? Because um, we did some studies looking at heat vulnerability and trying to identify based off of those gray boxes that I was talking about before, where are some of the most vulnerable or at-risk populations in Nebraska, especially in Douglas County? And we found that in Omaha, in the Omaha area, uh, that there's certain places based off of information that we understand about uh, scientific studies that have been done around the world and around the United States, epidemiological studies as well, that uh, certain places and certain populations are more at risk than others. And when we started looking at that here in, in the Omaha area, we realized that especially the northern part of Omaha is potentially more at, at risk of um, the consequences of extreme heat. One of the other things that we wanted to look at was, is there a potential impact of a historical redlining on um, temperature distribution. There's been some work around this. If anybody is not familiar, uh, red lighting is financial and institutional practices that were put in place in the United States uh, back in the early 1900s. Basically, what happened was financial institutions and, and other policies that were put in place made it difficult to invest in certain communities. And when you look at those communities uh, that were selected, a lot of times they had higher percentages of people of color are ethnic minorities within those communities. Now those practices are no longer in place, but we can still see the historical ramification of that in a lot of locations across the, the US. And so we were wondering if we could see any relationships in Douglas County with historical redlining that's happened there. So we did uh, this mapping campaign. We had 60 volunteers come out for a one day event. They put uh, instrumentation on their car drove around the city uh, monitoring and measuring temperature at three different times throughout the day to try to understand what is the temperature signature throughout the Omaha area. And we found a variety of different things. Um, one, uh, areas with more, as would be expected, with more green space, more parks, things like that, more trees in the neighborhood, were considerably cooler than areas that have more concrete industrial and development and less green space. We actually found that uh, it was about a 10 degree difference, 10 degree Fahrenheit, not Celsius, 10 degree Fahrenheit difference between um, some of these locations. And on this particular day, uh, in some of the parts of Omaha, it was almost 103 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas uh, it was around 92 degrees, 93 degrees 
um, Fahrenheit in other parts of the city. So that's 10 degrees warmer in those locations. And unfortunately, some of the places where we found the highest temperatures is where we also found some of the most at-risk populations. And so areas that are potentially more impacted by extreme heat had populations that were also potentially more at risk because of those gray boxes that I was talking about before, because some of those social determinants of health that I was talking about before. So going to water. We do a lot of work looking around flooding, drought, and extreme weather. Extreme weather, um, we know that we've seen in certain parts of the United States an increase in the severity and frequency of, of storms, especially heavy downpours, floods, droughts, and, and, uh, and just major storms in general. This can lead to injury, illness, displacement of populations, or even potentially death. At-risk populations is basically anybody in the pathway, but there are certain groups that are more at risk than others. And we're definitely familiar with this in this part of the country. Um, in 2019, one year before COVID, um, we saw the costliest inland flooding event in U.S. history, and, the, and Nebraska was at the center of that. Uh, this particular flooding event led to almost $11 billion of economic loss. There were at least three deaths. Um, hundreds of people were displaced. Uh, there were at least two hospitals, and again, going back to that healthcare piece and, and public health piece, there were at least two hospitals that sustained damage in Nebraska alone, and a dozen long-term care facilities, otherwise known as nursing homes, that were evacuated during that flooding event. And then uh, that was the initial flooding that occurred and the initial impacts but we still don't know the severity of how much of an impact this had on our populations here in Nebraska, because <laughs> there were uh, flood damage, damage to roads and infrastructure that lasted for weeks, months, or even years after, after the initial flooding event. And I always put this into perspective. If you're trying to seek treatment, uh, let's say in Omaha, Nebraska, which is where our main medical facility is, or one of our main medical facilities for the state. If you're trying to um, seek treatment in Omaha, and say you wanted to go up to Bloomfield, Nebraska, where I was from, where I'm from, um, that's typically about a three hour drive. But after the floodwaters had receded and I was trying to get up to Northeast Nebraska, it was about a five to six hour drive. And so all of a sudden, you're doubling the amount of time that you're on the road and increasing um, or decreasing that ability to access care. So flooding is obviously one of the big ones, but one of the areas that I'm really interested in is the impacts of drought on human health. Drought manifests in a lot different way than flooding or a lot of other extreme weather events. Most other extreme weather events, you can see that infrastructural damage right away, right? Hurricane comes in, heat wave comes in, whatever it is, you can see you can see it or you can feel it. Drought manifests more slowly. It evolves over time. And because it evolves over time, that means we don't necessarily see the impacts on our populations right away. And we don't see the impacts in our environment as easily, but again, we don't see those impacts on human health. But they are there. Um, so I said just a second ago that um, Heat waves likely kill more people in the United States. Internationally, when they, over the last century, when they've been monitoring drought or monitoring different extreme weather and climate related events, drought has likely resulted in more deaths internationally than any other climate or weather related disaster. And the reason for that is primarily famine and malnutrition in a lot of places. But that doesn't get at all those other pathways. And I put this up here just to illustrate Drought is a threat multiplier, like climate change. Drought increases the uh, ability for dust storms um, to form, and decreases air quality, more frequent wildfires, changes in water quality and water quantity, um, more intense heat waves. Here in the United States, a lot of our heat, or a lot of our heat-related deaths are attributed, um, are associated with drought events that have happened simultaneously. Changes in vector habitat, such as 
mosquitoes uh, having a relationship with drought and loss of agricultural and food security. And all these things can lead to human health outcomes and a variety of different human health outcomes. And so we've done some work around this. Um, here in Nebraska, we found that over around a 40 year period, we saw an increase in mortality in especially rural populations in Nebraska uh, associated with drought events. So, and that was in a, especially populations between the ages of 45 and 65 years of age. We saw an increase in mortality associated with drought. But that's just mortality. It doesn't get at what actually is going on. Like who is potentially dying from these drought events? And so we've done some uh, further investigation around this to try to understand what exactly is going on. We're continuing this work as well. And so with drought events, every state that's in red, it's listed up here, is where we saw an increase in uh, mortality when drought events occur, respiratory related mortality when drought events occur. And so uh, these are respiratory related deaths. Nebraska obviously is one of those states that's highlighted. And so we're continuing to try to investigate and further understand what's actually going on here. This only says respiratory related deaths, but is it asthma, COPD? Looking at ages of population, look at other factors. And we started to look at some of this. Um, one of the things that we found was during severe droughts, we find more um, respiratory related mortality, especially in parts of the United States that are uh, where we find these relationships. And then um, we also found that this occurs both in males and females, but uh, the response ratio is stronger in females than males, which makes us want to understand that relationship even further. And then we found a positive relationship both in um, metro and not metro, the so urban and rural areas, but the relationship was much stronger than in rural areas than it was in urban areas. So we're still trying to dig in and better understand some of these relationships and what's exactly going on. But like I said, we're not just doing research to do research. We wanna make sure that this is impactful in some way. And so we created, um, this is a multiple year process, a roadmap for uh, the federal, for NOAA and for other agencies to better engage public health in to drought and making sure that public health is more engaged when drought events occur. Because typically we don't really see drought as a threat here in the United States that they do in other parts of the world. Um, drought typically is thought of more of an agricultural issue or water resource issue. One of the things that we're trying to help better identify is that it is a public health issue as well. And so how do we better engage public health in this conversation? And even if you do engage them, what does that actually mean for them? And so we're in the process of uh, developing a messaging framework for public health professionals and healthcare professionals so that they can talk to, message, and communicate with other professionals and to the general population around the health threats associated with drought events here in the United States. And then air quality um, is another big area that we focused on. Um, this map's a little funny to read, but the yellow in green is where we have the highest rates of pediatric asthma hospitalizations in Douglas County. And as you can see, those rates are higher on that eastern part of the, um, of the county compared to the western part of the county. And one of the things that we've been interested in is why is that? Why is it that we're seeing higher rates of pediatric asthma hospitalizations in the eastern part of the county compared to the western part? Well, we've done a couple different analyses of this. One, uh, one of the studies that we did found that some of those social determinants of health, like I was talking about before, uh, seem to be a factor. We found that uh, when we find higher percentage of people of color and indicators for poverty, that's where we were finding some of the highest rates of uh, uh, pediatric asthma hospitalizations. And then we studied that even further. We found that those areas also have the worst air quality in the county as well. 
And so, um, so you have social factors that are potentially contributing to it. And then on top of it, you have uh, even those environmental factors that are potentially contributing to it as well. Now you'd be happy to talk more about this. One of the things that I put up here is the pollen ragweed season. And the reason I did that was at certain times of the year in Douglas County, we actually found that uh, pediatric asthma hospitalizations were stronger correlated with pollen and mold than they were with air quality around the summer, summer, early fall. And that's when we have ragweed pollen season as well. And we've been seeing an increase in ragweed pollen season in Nebraska by about 11 days over the last uh, couple decades. So this is one that's definitely taken up a lot of our time and, and effort uh, working around water quality and the impacts that that has on human health. And sure, I'm sure some of you have heard and paid attention to some of the impacts that water quality, uh, some of the issues associated with water quality here in the state of Nebraska. It's definitely gotten a lot of attention uh, with different news articles that have come out, media articles that have come out in the last uh, couple of years. Um, it's a complex issue. Uh, there's a variety of different uh, potential factors and a variety of different issues within it. I won't go into all the depth. I'll let Katie and others talk about that at, at length. Um, but some of the things that we've been concerned about is, um, you know, issues associated with nitrate in our water, and then also things like atrazine and other pesticides in the water as well, and especially private wells. So one of the things that um, we're interested in, like I said, was that nitrate issues. And I know certain parts of the state, and as many of you probably know, certain parts of the state have issues with nitrate in their well water. <coughs> and so um, that's set at 10 parts per million uh, for nitrate in drinking water based off the EPA safe drinking water standard. That standard is bet, uh, based off of met hemoglobinemia, otherwise known as uh, blue baby syndrome. It's not set based off of other health potential issues that could uh, uh, come about because of, of exposure to nitrate. There's been a number of different studies that have been done looking at nitrate exposure, both in animal models and research studies that have been done uh, more broadly, uh, more uh, as we would call it, ecological studies, looking at uh, human populations and exposure. And there's been a number of different, a number of these studies have shown a, po a negative health impact associated with uh, poor water quality and high nitrates in the water. And um, some of these studies have actually shown that less than 10 parts per million can potentially be related to uh, things like birth defects and pediatric cancers, and there have been seen some associations with that. And so high concentration of nitrate in drinking water, like I said, has been linked to adverse health outcomes. Uh, and there's a pretty known, uh, pretty well-known pathway in how that could potentially occur. And so that's minor health ailments, blue baby syndrome, preterm birth issues, birth defects, pediatric cancers, and adult cancers. So of all there's been studies that have shown some relationship. And again, like I said, there's also been studies looking at animal models as well. So they've done this with rats and mice and monkeys and things like that. And some of that work has been done here as well. Uh, there's been a few different studies that have looked at the relationship with pediatric cancer uh, in Nebraska with water quality. And some of the, and those studies have found that, especially when we have elevated levels of atrazine and nitrate in water, groundwater, is where we have some of the highest rates of pediatric cancer. So I'll just quickly mention this as well. Nebraska has one of the highest rates of pediatric cancer in the United States. It's one of the reasons 
that this work was started in the first place. Um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done on understanding these relationships and understanding which locations and which populations are most at risk. But for us, one of the big things is populations that are in private wells that are potentially not being tested. Because private wells do fall outside the Safe Drinking Water Act standard. And so the individual that owns that private well is the one that's responsible for making sure that that testing is being done on their well. And so, and like for example, I know uh, family members and individuals that have never had their well tested. And because of that, uh, one of the big things that we're trying to do is how do we better educate and inform people so that they do testing and make sure that we have opportunities to reduce exposure. And in order to do that, we've been trying to touch on this in multiple different ways, through education, outreach, research, and monitoring. We've been working with Katie and others around this. Um, we've done everything from working on developing high school and middle school lessons to get people more engaged in water quality testing and understanding what are those potential impacts, doing uh, training for healthcare professionals. This is an area that we're interested in so that they can help educate the populations that are most at risk. Working with uh, extension to help better address and educate individuals around some of these issues. Uh, understanding what are some of the societal and economic costs. Doing more research, both within the region. Why is Nebraska different than Iowa, Kansas, or some of the surrounding states? And better understanding what are some of those relationships, which is an area that we're going to be moving forward with. And then the work that we've been doing, looking at pediatric cancer and thyroid cancer here in the state of Nebraska and other uh, potential health ailments as well. We've been working with Nebraska DHHS to create uh, an environmental public health tracking program for the state. And so this will help uh, local health departments have better access to information around environmental issues within their regions so that they can help with addressing these issues. And then working with um, uh, college engineering on a citizen science uh, water quality monitoring project so that individuals have access to uh, free uh, water quality testing within the state as well. I won't bore you with all the videos. Um, if we had more time, I would show some of these, but looking at what are some of the economic impacts, oh, I'll just skip through that. Like I said, the Citizen Science Water Quality Monitoring Project, one of the things that we did was helping create a dashboard for that so that they can better visualize and people could, that are testing their well water be able to look at it and compare it to others in the area. And then, like I said, that Environmental Public Health Tracking Program, and uh, which will hopefully provide better information to the state of Nebraska and public health officials that are trying to address some of these issues. And water quality is one of those um, that's on that list. And then outreach and engagement, of individuals like Laura, Katie, um, and making sure that we're providing these materials in a broad, diverse way, because you know, obviously we have uh, diverse populations within the state of Nebraska, and we need to make sure that we're touching as many populations as possible with these materials so that they better understand those threats and then get them testing their wells or being able to have opportunities to mitigate against some of those impacts as well. And then educational opportunities and then trying to just be as engaged as possible within the community. Um, because without doing community work and engagement, this isn't gonna go anywhere. So one of the things we really wanna do, and one of the things I'm very passionate about is like I said, not just doing research to do research, but how do you actively uh, and effectively communicate and engage with populations, especially those that are most at risk to reduce their risk and find opportunities to better support them. And so with that, I'll wrap it up. Um, this is just some of our work. We've got a lot more things that we're focused on. If you're interested, I brought some pamphlets about the Water Climate and Health Program. Feel free to come up and get those if you're here. If you're online, uh, unfortunately, maybe we can mail them to you. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we're supported through the Clarem Hubbard Foundation. Um, we've also received funding from NOAA, NASA, CDC, um, and other institutions as well. And so with that, 
uh, if you have any information or if you're interested, feel free to, to sign up uh, and visit our website. Uh, we're actually going to be having, uh, we have a seminar series that we host, webinar, a webinar series that we host. And the next one is next week. We're going to be talking about some of our drought products that we've been developing. And so with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those. Um, and I appreciate your time. All right, we're going to try to get the microphone here for you online. Does anyone have questions back here? Thanks, Josie. That was uh, a really great overview over a, and it just made me think as you were going through a lot of examples that the the thing that seems to be the challenge is a lot of whether it's like city planning the way it's been done and there's kind of like this uh, I, I guess you know, there's a there's a policy and administrative kind of uh, steam engine that kind of is pushing forward towards the direction of keeping going in that way or there's economic forces at play of people wanting to continue doing things that they're doing in certain ways and it's just like there's a lot of uh, not calling it of like uphill but maybe sure, like uphill work here. And I, I just wondered, like, from so from a from a policy political standpoint, are there signs that you've seen of, um, like, yeah, like for for people that are really passionate about this, are, are there some good signs of of uh, ways to kind of shift some of those dynamics? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it's a hard question. Too, right? I, I agree. Like a lot of it does feel uphill at times. I, 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 I'll give two examples. One is around the heat work that we've done. You know, we did the urban heat island mapping campaign. We connected with uh, city officials before we did the event. We kept them in the loop on it. Um, and, and, then after that was done, we were kind of, you know, we were looking for next steps. We were continuing some of these conversations and we started talking with the health departments within Douglas County and Lancaster. And both are definitely concerned and interested in, and all these parties are interested in how to better address these issues. And, you know, we, we provided the science, we provided the information and then Partially from that came the development of a community of practice. And so now on a regular basis, it's about every two weeks to a month, I forget, we're meeting with individuals and stakeholders to talk about what are we doing collectively? What's individuals doing? What are other places doing around this? And then trying to move the meter in some way to actually do collective action. And I, I feel like that's been really positive. And I don't feel like anybody has pushed back too hard on that. Um, and I, I think there's gonna be some really, um, I don't know, I'm hopeful that there's gonna be some actions that are gonna come from that work because it has been an open dialogue, starting with the science, starting with the information and then trying to share that um, to try to take some kind of action within the community. So that has been a good one. The water quality one, I think is another interesting perspective on this as well, because, you know, early, I think some people probably felt that we were trying to attack, especially agriculture in this process. And I'm hopeful that it continues to go in the right direction because that, that, you know, without agriculture being engaged in this process, we're never going to get into it. And so we can't make agriculture the, the, the bad guy in this process. And, and one of the things that we've tried to do, and I know Katie has been a part of some of those conversations, 
having really good open conversations with with individuals and i think that's led to some positive things but i mean that one's still the jury's still out on that one but i'm, I'm still hopeful for that uh that we can continue to make this moving and keep this moving forward and I, uh, and so that's where i always try to start is providing the foundation of what do we know what do we understand and then how do we build from there and you're definitely going to make missteps along the way i know i have 100 percent as we've been addressing some of these issues but learning from that and realizing for the most part nobody is you know the uh, no nobody wants to be a bad actor in any of these issues Typically, most people want to find solutions, want to be engaged. And so once you start those conversations and then be open in that way, and sometimes it's going to meet with people that might not really want to hear what you're talking about, but being willing to just be like, all right, this is what we know and this is what we understand. Um, at least at that point, you know, we can get on the same page that we're trying to do a similar action, which is for me is protecting human health. And, especially those that are most at risk. I don't know, Katie, do you have any thoughts, especially on the water quality? Or you can let that one. I think I'll leave this one to you today, but I think you've really emphasized the community and the collaboration and the discourse. Um, and I, I have a follow-up question is, do you think we have the capacity um, to support some of those efforts you're doing? Oh, that's a good and question. Statewide, nationally, university, any scope. I think that is definitely an area that we could develop more around. I think we have a lot of the capacity and we have a lot of really good engaged people, but I would love for even if it was me and you know we actually just talked about this, having some potential strategic hires around um, community engagement, community led projects, um, how to do that in a more effective and better way and even researching to improve our our capacity in that area as well so you, you mentioned the issue with nitrates and atrazine and water and wells they're mostly probably private wells so i'm assuming this is probably mostly a rural more agricultural issue do you have any idea for a percentage of people that currently are testing their wells that's a, Eric, that's a great Because I, I, I could tell you I'm helping develop a self-assessment for whether any farms. This is an absolute question we could put in there. Are you testing your wells for these different things? Yeah, I you know, I'm going to say that we don't have a great grasp on that because I don't even think we have a great grasp on the number of wells within the state overall. Katie, is that a fair assessment? That is accurate. Okay. And... You know, one of the things that has given me the most joy out of this work is I've had people come up to me and tell me that they've got their well tested because they were worried about their, you know, their health or their kids' health or their grandchildren's health. And if, and I don't want panic and pandemonium running through the state about worrying about water quality, but I want people enough concerned that at least they, they understand what are the potential threats there as well. Um, and yeah, it's it's mostly, I would say it's most it, private wells is the big one, you know, places like Lincoln and Omaha, they're testing and monitoring the water pretty effectively. And, you know, if you run like one of those nitrate strips on, uh, which I've done in Omaha, and actually I've done it here in, in Lincoln as well, like you'll come up close to zero, typically. And so th this is definitely for me, a little bit more of that private well and just getting them to be more engaged around testing. There's obviously some barriers for that, but I, I think that would be, I mean, it would be beneficial to one, better understand how many people within the state are testing. If they're not, why not? And uh, if there are barriers, then how do we get past some of those barriers to make sure that people are testing? And then also, my worst case scenario, which I don't want, which I, you know, there's opportunities around this as well, is having people test, find out they have a problem, and then being like, well, that's too bad. 
like what are the potential solutions for that individual and making sure that we have effective solutions, which I know Katie and Laura and some others over in extension have been working on um, helping people better understand what are their options and trying to address some of those issues. Yeah. Well. But people understand the risk, particularly through, you know, this affecting their kids or grandkids and they might be more willing to act, at least yeah. you would think. Yeah. All right, we probably have time for one more question if we have one. Okay, I must say like um, great presentation, Jessica. I, Jesse, sorry. I wanted to ask, um, sorry, uh, the aspect of um, exposure and vulnerability was really interesting to me. And I wanted to ask, have you probably thought about um, the aspect of early warning system, especially with regards to health impact and uh, the public health impact and extreme event? Can you ask that first part of the question? Yeah, I want to make sure I understood it correctly. I wanted to ask if you've considered like the aspect of early warning, early action aspect, especially with regards to public health and uh, extreme climate events. Yes, yeah, that's definitely an area that we're really interested in. We're, we're potentially going to explore more and research and engagement as well. Um, actually working on a proposal right now that that's a big piece of it. Um, one of the things that, and, and that uh, one of the, the guidance document that we helped with creating around drought is, you know, there's basically the different stages of any disaster, right? There's the, before it happens and making sure that you have educated populations and educated individuals and professionals that are working on the issue while it's happening, how do you respond at time? And then after it happens, how do you potentially respond to the lingering effects? But then also, how do you learn from what you've just experienced so that you can do it better the next time? And that's an active area that we want to do more work on, um, and especially engaging within this region and, and internationally as well. Um, I'm actually, uh, you know, Mark Savota is part of this uh, the National Drought Mitigation Center. Um, he and some others asked me to be a part of this uh, uh, drought resilience planning effort that's taking place over the next year. And part of it is how do we do this on an international level so that we can be more, more engaged around drought events. And part of that is building better preparedness before, especially in public health departments and health ministries to be able to address those events. So yeah, that's definitely an area that we're very interested in. I got one thing online. All right, answer that one online. All right, have you explored the correlation between extreme weather conditions and the impact on mental health or the prevalence of infectious disease? Very quickly, yes. Uh, the mental health piece is one uh, we've looked mostly in the context of drought. We published a paper a year or two ago, and I published a few papers looking at mental and behavioral health outcomes associated with drought. Um, and uh, we're interested in continuing and expanding some of that work. And then the prevalence of infectious disease. Uh, I've got a couple students that are interested in especially mosquito-borne diseases. Um, and trying to do some work around that. Uh, and I've done a little bit before working on dengue and uh, valley fever in the southwestern part. Valley fever is a fungal infection in the southwestern part of the United States. So yes. All right, let's give Jesse another round of applause. All right, thank you all so much for attending. If you need to come down and chat with Jesse afterwards, you're more than welcome to. He's pretty easy to contact via email. So go ahead and follow up. Thanks.